I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, these things that we believed in together this week. The kids believed in, and, and uh, as I said, some were saved, and that's just a tremendous week to have children come, and specifically, they get saved, they, they come to know Jesus Christ. But I can tell you that um, in order to believe all these things up here, the kids had to have faith. And see, that's where we start at. Faith is the basis of our belief. Uh, we, we believe or we don't believe. And I, I can tell you this, that the, the Bible tells us that Jesus gives us a measure of faith. That means there's already a measure of faith inside you. God gave that to you. So you have this measure of faith that's inside you. And you might believe a little bit or you might think, well, there could be something to this. And that's the reason you're here. That's the reason you sent your kids here, your grandkids here, or your nieces and nephews. It's the reason that they're here is because we have a measure of faith inside of us. That measure was given to us by God so that we can, uh, we can have this small belief. I think everybody has a little bit of faith. Some people ignore it. They say it's not true. The Bible also tells us that... Uh, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we, we need the Bible. The Bible is the basis of our belief. It is what we take and we say, okay, this is the word of God. This is what God gave to man. Men wrote it down. It doesn't matter what version you read out of the Bible because God, his spirit, protects his word. In other words, the, the, the message that God wants you to get, you'll get because his spirit is on the word. The word in the Greek is logos, and, and the spirit is rhema. And when those two come together, it's a perfect understanding of God's word. You don't misunderstand what God wants you to get. That's why I can preach so badly and, 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 and do a terrible job, and you can still get a message out of it. It's because the Holy Spirit is here delivering the word that you need to hear. And he's a wonderful God, and we praise him, and we worship him because of that. Also, as we, we go through this whole idea of faith, having this, this faith um, comes by the Spirit. As we said, we have a measure of faith that's given to us by God. But it can grow or it can diminish. Uh, you have a faith in the chair that you're sitting in, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting there. If you thought it was going to fall down with you, you wouldn't have any faith in it. But we have a measure of faith in God, so as we believe in Him a little bit, our faith grows when we depend on Him or when we get close to Him. I wanted to talk a little bit about faith today, true faith. I guess I made up my own thing. I wasn't the true hope or the true love or the true power or the true riches or the true peace. Uh, because I, I think it takes faith, true faith, to believe any one of these things up here. You have to have faith in order to believe it. I was, uh, I was thinking about faith, and as I was praying about what God wanted me to, to bring to you, I thought about the, the faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. If you have some time this week, maybe you just want to go to the book of Hebrews and, and look at chapter 11, and it talks about faith. It talks about all the people that have faith in God, even though the things that they believed in never happened before they died. They didn't happen, so they, but they still had faith that they would happen. Faith is an interesting thing because uh, there's some people out there that have great faith and there's some people out there that have little faith. And I was thinking about as I was reading through Hebrews 11, I guess the, the two people that had great faith were invited to probably the biggest event on earth. And do you remember the story when Jesus was transfigured? In other words, he took Peter, James, and John, he went to the top of this mountain, and he was changed into a heavenly form, and there beside him was Moses and who? Anybody know? Moses and Elijah. Okay? Moses and Elijah appeared next to Jesus as he was raised up, as he was transfigured. And so I, I thought about those two guys, Moses and Elijah, are... Moses is talked about in Hebrews 11, but Elijah isn't. Elijah just comes down to, I think it's verse 35 or something like that in, in that Hebrews 11, and it talks about the prophets. The prophets had great faith. They believed in God. And Elijah was a great prophet. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll pick Elijah. I'll talk about Elijah. 
I can tell you that in, in, in James chapter 5, verse 17, what it says about Elijah is really interesting because God, uh, God lets us know that Elijah was a person just like you and me. He wasn't anybody special. He was just a guy. And he was obedient and he had faith. Here's what it says. It says, uh, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Wow. That's faith. Wouldn't it be cool to be like a weatherman and, and, and have that kind of faith in God, and you could say, okay, today it's going to be bright and sunny, because I'm not going to let it rain. I'm praying. That's worse. And then it wouldn't rain. Or you could say, well, you know, we need some rain and, and stuff, so today I'm going to pray, and, and it's going to rain. That would be cool. It would be cool to be able to have that kind of faith to affect the weather. That's what Elijah did, that he had that kind of faith. In fact, let's, let's go to the story of Elijah. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 17. If you have your Bible today, you can kind of keep up with me. I'm not going to read a whole bunch of scripture. I'm just going to tell the story of what happened in that process. Well, a little ways. We'll work through it a little ways. 1 Kings chapter 17 is where we'll start. Here we have um, Elijah. God sends Elijah to King Ahab. And he goes to King Ahab and he says, uh, King Ahab, he says, uh, uh, it's not going to rain until I say so. That's pretty bold to go to the king and say, hey, it's not going to rain until I say it's okay. And so he goes and he, it doesn't rain. It doesn't rain. It stops. It doesn't rain. It's in the desert countries anyway. And, and because of that, uh, no rain, no life. In fact, in the desert, the, the actual idea of water or having water means life. But if you've got no water, it means death. In the desert, this was a tough place to be in a, in a drought. And so here we have Elijah, and he prays, and it doesn't rain. So by his prayer, he controls the weather. I like that. I like that idea. A man like you and me, a man like you and I, women, I can't say that to women, you're not men, but, but he was a person like you and I, just normal, and he prayed and, and it didn't rain. I like that idea. So then God tells him to go to the brook of Cherith. And he says, I'll send birds there to feed you. So he goes there, and, and these ravens begin to bring him food. And they bring him food, and uh, they, he's a, he, you know, a raven is a scavenger bird. He goes out and kills, it gets up the roadkill. He eats the roadkill off the road, okay? So here we have a Jewish boy who is Elijah, who has a specific kind of um, uh, dietary uh, understanding. He, he's not allowed to eat certain foods. And so the ravens are bringing him things like fish with scales on them, bringing him meat and bread. They're bringing him these things. So here he is. He prays, and he controls the birds. He controls these scavenger birds. So not only is this guy who's like you and me can control uh, the weather, but he can control these scavenger birds. They, they, wherever he goes they, around the brook, they bring the food to him. He eats the food. Things are going really, really good. The only problem is, is that um, he has to leave there because the brook dries up. Why did the brook dry up? Because some crazy preacher said, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. It didn't rain for three and a half years. And it, the brook dried up, so he had no water, so he had to move on. He had to go someplace else. So he prayed, he asked God, God, where should I go? And God sent him, uh, let's see, I've got to catch up on my notes. God sent him to Zarephath. The brook dried up. God sent him to Zarephath, which is the city where um, King Ahab's wife, or his queen, is from. The name, of, the name Zarephath actually means um, a place where metal is melted down into pure gold. That's what it means, Zarephath. Zarephath. And I can tell you this, that King Ahab's wife, her name is Jezebel, and she hates she hates with a passion. She hates Elijah. 
Because she believes in the other gods. She believes in Asherah. She believes in Baal. And she follows those prophets. And, and, and so she believes in them. And she hates him. She hates when he has any kind of advantage. And she really hates the idea that he said it's not going to rain. There's been a drought for three and a half years. So Elijah, on his way there, he... Uh, he runs into a lady who is making some biscuits and gravy. And uh, she's preparing this, this, this food. Actually, she's preparing her last meal for her and her son. She tells, she tells him, he says, hey, let me have some of the biscuits and gravy. And she says, no, I can't. Said, this is all I have left. There's a drought. There's a famine. And so there's no food for us. And so this is all my son and I have left. And, and as soon as we eat this, we're going to go hungry and we'll die. And he said, no, no, I, I want you to make it. And he said, I promise you that, the, um, uh, that the, the flour and the oil will never run dry. You'll always have flour and you'll always have oil. It'll never run dry. Just make it and give me the first biscuit, okay? So she gives him the first biscuit. Guess what? There's flour and oil. So here's a man who can control weather. Here's a man who can control birds. Here's a man who can, what, did I miss one? And here's a man who can control birds. Yeah, here's a man who can control flour and oil. Like, this guy's like you and me. Just like you and me. Except for he has a faith. He has a great faith. <laughs> anyway, here, here is uh, Elijah. He goes to Zarephath and he, he meets this woman. He gets, gets the food. And uh, it, this, uh, this woman, Jezebel, hates him with a passion. Isn't it funny how God, when you begin to follow him, he will, he will take you back into the presence of your enemies? Isn't it funny? David found that out. That's why he wrote the 23rd Psalm. He said, in the presence of my enemies, you have a banquet for me. My cup's running over and, and you anoint my head with oil. Right there in the presence of my enemies. Why does God do that in the presence of our enemies? I think he likes to kick our enemies off. I think he likes to make them mad, get them riled up. Because he is God, and he deserves the glory, and he deserves all these things. But he's using Elijah, and Elijah has this so-called power when it's really faith. It's just him praying and asking God. But he's just a man like you and me. He's just a man who is, um, who is being obedient to God. I guess I could say that I'm really like Elijah at that point because if, if I'm hungry, I want the first biscuit too. Anybody with me? You're hungry? Fix me a sandwich. I want something to eat. I'm hungry. That's the way I feel like I'm like Elijah. I'm not so much in the faith department, but more in the, yeah, I'll eat when it's ready. I'll take the first one. I'm not afraid. Okay? Speaking of that, after we're done here, everybody's invited to a picnic. We're going to be... Uh, uh, having some food and stuff together and enjoying our day. I'd take more than one of this. What? It, see, Daniel, you're like you're like Elijah here too. Okay, let me keep going. Okay, catch up to where I am. Elijah eats with this lady and her son, stays there for a little while, and then he leaves. And after he leaves, something happens. The lady's son dies. And so she comes and she finds Elijah and she says, my son has died and you need to come back. And so he goes back and he, he takes the boy and he takes him into the room. And the Bible says that he jumps on him three times. Now, if I jumped on anybody three times, they would be dead. Okay? You know that. I know that. Uh, and, and, and if it wasn't for the resurrection power of God, resurrecting power of God, then it would be murder instead of resurrection because jumping on a poor kid. But he jumps on this kid and the kid comes back to life, okay? So here we have a guy who can, you can say it with me, controls weather patterns. He controls the birds. Here's a guy who controls flour and oil. Here's a man who, well, what was the last one we talked about? Oh, yeah, the flour and oil, okay. And now here's, here's a man who can raise people from the dead. 
guy just like you and me, guy just like you and me. But he has this great faith. He has this great faith. Sun comes back to life, everything's cool. <laughs> Let's go to keep for uh, 1 Kings 18. We'll start that chapter now. I kind of told the story going on down. 1 Kings 18, he, he tells his servant, he says, go tell the king, go tell King Ahab that uh, I want to have a contest. Okay? We're going to have this contest between gods. And what, what took place there is uh, that he says, I want you to bring your prophets and, and the prophets of your gods, and I'll come and we'll have this contest. So they, they went up on the mountain and, and they began to have this contest. They were going to uh, build a stone, um, what do you call it, altar? Yeah. <laughs> I'm making this up as I go, okay? I'm not... I'm memorizing. They built the stone altar. They cut the sacrifice. And then they put the wood in there and everything so that it would burn. But here was the thing. They were supposed to pray and cry out and ask God to send out fire to devour this. That was the stipulation. That was the contest. So the Asherah bunch, okay? There were 400 prophets of Asherah. And they came in and, and they began to pray and dance around and, and chant and yell and holler and scream and everything. And uh, they just got to the place where, man, this isn't working. All right, we give up. We give up. Our God is not the strongest. Okay, so they left. The prophets of Asher left. And then there was 450 prophets of Baal. And these guys were very serious. I mean, they were very serious. They got out there and they started chanting and they started screaming and hollering. The Bible says they even took knives and they cut themselves and they, they were yelling and screaming, trying to, trying to talk to their God. And, and you can see he, uh, Elijah's over there and he is, he is telling them, he's saying, uh, why don't you yell a little louder? Maybe your God is asleep. Yell louder. Or maybe your God took a vacation. Maybe you just need to, uh, you know, wait till he gets back or whatever. But two-thirds of the day went by. These guys yelling and screaming, cutting themselves. And finally, Elijah stands up and says, that's enough. Let me show you how it's done. And so he, he sends his servants down off the mountain. He rebuilds the, the, uh, the altar. And he sets the stones up and puts the wood just right. And he, he puts the meat on the altar, and then he digs a trench all the way around the outside of this altar. And he, he has his servants go down to the bottom of the mountain and bring up jars of water. In fact, they do it three times. Three guys bring three jars of water each time, back and forth, up and down, and they pour the water on the sacrifice. So there's no way somebody's cigarette butt is going to set this baby off. And what's he do? You know what is interesting about this story? They're in the middle of a three and a half year family. And God is asking for the thing they need the most. That's interesting to me. I would be willing to say this. What is the one thing you can't afford to give up in a three and a half year drought? Yeah. Water. And he's got him bringing this water up and dumping it on this fire, or on the, 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 the thing before the fire comes. If you want to see the glory of God, then God is going to ask you for the thing that you're afraid to give up. So many of us in this day and time, we depend on money. We depend on the doctors, hospitals. We depend on those things, and those are the, the things that we lean on. Those are the things we have faith in. My pension, I've got, I got faith in my pension. I'll, I'll get this, and this will carry us through. Now, I've been to those third world countries where people don't have pensions where they don't have hospitalization, where they don't have those things, and they can't depend on those things, and all they can depend on is God. So many times, we've got to give up the thing that we, need, we think we need the most in order for God to take over. It's happened in my life. I remember when money was my God. I had to make money. I had to make lots of money. I wanted to be rich. 
I wanted to build my own little kingdom. But I can tell you this, God had another plan. God said, you've got to give it all away. I remember the story of Jesus and the rich man. When the rich man came, rich young ruler came to him and said, you know, I, I know everything to do here, but how do I receive eternal life? And then Jesus told him, he said, you've got to go and give all your money to the poor. Because not because he wanted Jesus wanted to take his money, or, or I'm not saying that because we need, we need your money. I'm just saying this: whatever it is, is that standing between you and God is usually what God wants to remove or to move out of the way. Whatever it is, because we really truly can't serve Him and follow Him until those things are gone. Middle of three and a half year drop, they're dumping water. Water that people could be drinking. Water that could be put on the ground so that it would grow crops. God's requiring what we think we need the most. That's where real faith comes in. Real faith in God. Real faith in what He's doing. Here we have Elijah and he prays. I got a problem with this. Okay? I have faith... I'm not saying it's faith like Elijah, but I have faith in God. All Elijah does is pray and whoosh, I mean, the fire comes down, it devours the, the sacrifice, it devours the wood, it even melts the stones down and licks up all the water in the trench. God showed up. God loves those kind of odds too. What were the, the prophets of Asher, the prophets of Baal? 850 prophets were there against Elijah. God likes that kind of odds because God deserves the glory and he'll give his glory. The water, the, the water was lapped up, the rocks melted down to nothing. The fire was so hot. The problem I have is, is I pray for stuff like that all the time. Lord, would you please heal this person? Lord, would you please bring these people to Christ? And I pray for people for 10 years and... and See, I, I think that Elijah's faith took him to a place in his walk with God where he depended on God every single second of every day. We're dependent on all these other things. We're dependent on our car to get us back and forth to work. We're dependent on uh, the job so that we make the money to put the gas in and pay the bills and do those things. Instead of being dependent on God, we're depending on these, all these things. All the kingdom, the kingdom that we've set up for ourselves. Whereas if we become more like Elijah, then our prayers maybe would be answered like this because we'd have the mind of Christ, we'd be thinking like he wanted to, to think, and we'd have close connection with him, we'd be living in his presence so we know what he wants, and we would be able to have this kind of faith if we lived like that. But we don't. Really don't. There's a man just like you and me, able to control weather patterns, able to control, I can't remember of everything, able to control the birds, able to control flour and oil, able to raise people from the dead, and now praise that God devours. Like you lived a little closer to God than we did. How's your faith? That's really what it comes down to today. You know, we can we can look at all these things up here on the stage, and we can say, uh, you know, okay, true peace, true riches. We can believe, oh yeah, maybe that's for somebody else. read the Bible and it says when somebody gets sick, oh, go to the doctor and get pills and, and have surgeries and then that'll fix everything. The Bible doesn't say that. It says one, one among you sick, call together the elders of the church and lay hands on that person. But what's the first thing we do? Call the doctor. Call the ambulance. Quick. we got to go to the hospital. There's nothing about God there. We have worked our way away from God because we don't want to admit that he's in charge of everything. <coughs> I think 
think that's why our faith is waning. That's why our faith is little. Our faith in God's word is not enough for us to read it. Our faith in prayer is not enough for churches to get together and pray. We don't even pray. Why don't we pray? Because prayer is this thing that makes no sense. When people come together and they just talk and, and they expect the words to go somewhere and someone to hear them and change the situation. You know what? That's all about faith. You know what? There's, there's this spark. There's this spark that I see where people are beginning to, their faith is growing and they're beginning to depend on God, usually because times are tough. Folks, we're in tough days. Economically, we can say we're in tough days. Things have gotten better. People are, people are always making that judgment, trying to figure out one way or the other how things are going. But you know what? It comes right down to our pocketbook. It comes right down to our job situation. It comes right down to those things that are going to be the clue whether or not things are going well. I can tell you this. Go to a third world country and see how things are going there financially. Where you've got kids going around collecting pop bottles, just hoping they can get enough pop bottles to feed at least their self for that day because mom and dad don't have any food. They don't have any shoes. They got one pair of clothes. And then we are here in our riches and thinking, man, we got it so bad. And our faith gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But things have been turned around. We've seen people in our church who, who have come to an altar of prayer and say, I need people to anoint me. And there's healings that have been happening. There are people that who uh, have lived all their lives as uh, following Satan and going the opposite direction. People you never think who would come to know Christ and then all of a sudden they're showing up in church and, and they've had an experience with God and God has a love for them and faith is starting to increase. Faith is increasing because God is at work. And we believe in Him. And we're starting to understand what, it's, what it means to live in His presence and, and depend on Him instead of, uh, you know, something bad happening and me getting on my cell phone and calling my wife. I start talk to God right away. Then I'll call her later because He's the one who can deal with the problem right now. We always make Him the last ditch effort. Well, nothing else. The doctors can't fix me. I guess we'll go to God. You see where what we've done with faith? You see why we're struggling so hard? How do we build our faith? We put God back in the number one spot in our lives. We put His Word. You're not going to know His Word unless you read it. You're not going to get a word from God unless you read it. So the Bible should be the number one thing. It's the part of relationship where we talk to God and God talks to us. Sometimes through His Word and sometimes all different kinds of ways into us. But He gets His message across. I often wonder, I wish Elijah, that they would have written about how God answered him. Elijah, was He talking to him? Did He write him a note? <laughs> you know? I, I think in our day and time, God is probably going to go next to like texting. Okay, so you get a text from God. <laughs> no, nah, I don't think so. God didn't make that. God made all kinds of other ways to, to talk to us. But God wants to communicate with us. We're his people. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants our basis of our life to be focused on the Bible, based on the Bible, so that we can follow him and know what he wants. He wants our faith to increase when people say, I'm sick and I need somebody to anoint me. And they come forward and they lay hands on that person. And we believe in faith through in the blood of Jesus Christ and in the power that is there. And they, that person gets healed. All those things build our faith. We need our faith muscle strength. Let's get back to what God wants. 
We've depended so long on so many other things. But let's get back to what God wants. How do we do that in this setting today? I'm almost out of time. That's why people are starting to get up and go and get to their positions. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is we say, by a statement of faith, we'd be willing to come and say, you know what, I've got a problem. I've got an illness. I'm sick. Maybe the doctors have seen you and they don't know what to do, or they're giving you medications and it's not working. Let's depend on God. Let's see what God will do. No. Let's know what God will do. That's where faith comes in. It's not a trial and error thing. It's real. It's real. You know, we've sent our kids to this program all week long. Our grandkids are... We, we send them and they have this great faith. I mean, it's amazing to hear these kids and some of their stories. And their faith goes way beyond us. You know why? Because they're depending on us too. They look at us and go, man, I hope that guy don't mess up. I hope my dad doesn't mess up and lose his job. I hope my mom does the right things. Those kids are looking at us, but you know what? Their faith in God is very strong. And they believe. And they'll gather around with the kids and they'll pray for them. We've had some situations this week where that's taken place. See, that's the way a church should look, too. You're talking to somebody in, their, in, in, your, in your row and, and all of a sudden they're telling you about how they're sick or something's going on. You know what you should do automatically? Well, not, let's go tell Pastor Doc uh, and... Uh, and we'll put you on the prayer chain. And No, just reach over and grab their hand and say, let me pray for you. And get some people around you and say, come here, let's pray for this person. Here's what's happening. Here's what's going on. You want to know what the true church looks like? The true church looks like all these little churches all over the place who gather wherever we gather two or more, Christ is with us. This is just where we meet. We're the church. I just wanted to encourage you today to build your faith. Depend on God. Don't be afraid. People will say, oh, you're stupid. People will say, oh, you're ignorant for doing that. Well, I'm the dumbest, happiest person there ever was. Thank you. Because I'm depending on what God says. I believe his word. I don't believe them because I see them mess up. Well, what I don't see is God doesn't mess up. God doesn't mess up. He doesn't make the mistakes that man does. And so my belief has gone to Him. My trust has gone to Him. I have a faith in Him. And I believe that He can heal the sick. I believe that He can raise the dead. I believe that He can make people who, are, uh, who can't talk to be able to talk and who can't hear to be able to hear. I believe in this God. And I believe that he can do these things today. That hasn't stopped. And it isn't going to stop. Because our God's alive and he's on the throne. Amen. And so we don't stop believing. Are you with me? What do you say? How's your faith? How's your faith? Stay. And let me tell you about the faith.